Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Inflation in the U.S. started to 8.5% in March, the fastest 12-month rise since 1981. Annual inflation moderated in April, but the consumer price index still increased at a rapid pace. The Eurozone has also witnessed record high inflation, and the emerging markets, which are more vulnerable to shocks, are feeding the pain. Where is inflation heading? Can governments and central banks find effective tools to stabilize prices? To explore these questions and more, I'm joined today by Jim Rogers, an international investor, Miguela Gerace, former Under Secretary of State of the Ministry of Economic Development of Italy, and Wang Dan, Chief Economist of Hansen Bank China. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to the show, Wang Dan. I will start with you. You know, we have been hearing of uh, this warning of a uh, uh, record high uh, of inflation either in the U.S. or European countries. I mean, how serious is it and where are we now? Well, we know that inflation ultimately is a monetary phenomenon. So it's no surprise that after printing so much money from the Federal Reserve and European Central Banks, uh, we are seeing the kind of goose inflation right now. But to me, it looks, like, it looks that the American inflation is going to plateau. Uh, so is the European inflation. And because uh, the energy prices seem to be stabilizing. And if the war in Ukraine has stopped, then we'll see this downward trend in commodity prices. And as the economy going back to normal, uh, we will see a higher production of consumer goods, which will also help to bring down the consumer inflation. Miguel, uh, you know, sitting from a European point of view, you know, uh, what's your outlook? What's your understanding of the inflation situation like in European countries? The situation in Europe is actually uh, getting a, a little bit worse because uh, I think we also suffer of a delayed effect. Uh, we mentioned, of course, the pumping of money during the COVID, but in a way we're also suffering from the effect of uh, the global financial crisis that has pushed the new money into the market and the European Central Bank has been acting uh, uh, very aggressively into the monetary system uh, in uh, Europe. And this is, uh, in a way, expected. When uh, we run out uh, of uh, investment uh, ideas, uh, or when the efficiency of new investment uh, starts to decline, then that new money that was kind of hidden under the carpet before comes to surface uh, and creates this effect, which is really the worst possible outcome, because we have now uh, high inflation, prices up, uh, the whole situation that we know with the energy prices. Uh, and so this is really the last drop that we need here. It, it, we thought we were going to be recovering, and now we get to the second hit. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Jim, it seems that uh, there are different opinions. You know, uh, the uh, Nobel laureate uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz said that, that the magnitudes of the current uh, you know, price hikes uh, uh, has have exceeded that of the 1970s uh, you know, the US has experienced. Well, former uh, Fed Chairman Bernanke said it's not anywhere near that of the 1970s. Uh, so, what you know? How do you see this current inflation? Well, this will actually be worse in the 1970s before it's over. You know, the United States is now a debtor nation, and in the 1970s we were a creditor nation. We have never printed nearly as much money as we have been printing, but not just us, the Bank of Japan, the, you know, everybody, everybody has been printing staggering amounts of money. The People's Bank of China has been more restrained than most, but even they are printing money. So this is going to be a huge mess before it's over. Yes, if there's peace in Ukraine, the price of wheat will come down, the price of oil will come down for a while. But no, we have supply demand problems developing, money supply problems developing, be very, buy yourself some silver. That's some advice for investors here. Yes, one day, you know, look at this, uh, this round of inflation. We do see a lot of factors are at display, right? Uh, you know, you have this uh, supply disruption globally, uh, and you have war, you have uh, some of the lockdowns in parts of the world. You have this, of course, uh, you know, uh, several stimulus packages in Washington and other parts of the world. And, uh, you know, food crisis, the fertilizer, et cetera. It, it will take some time probably to ultimately 
being tamed. That's absolutely true. Uh, when global shortage becomes this new norm, uh, it needs some new structural approach to tackle this problem. Uh, when we look at the US economy, actually, I think the goods inflation will probably come down pretty soon. Uh, as the economy normalizes, people tend to consume more services rather than goods, but the wage inflation tend to stagger, uh, tend to be there for a very long time. Uh, right now, the labor market is pretty tight there, and the union power has been stronger than ever. So what I'm more worried about, about this persistent inflation, is prolonged inflation in wages, because that will erode the competitiveness, less, especially manufacturing, for even longer time than the goods inflation can, can persist. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, what's your response to that? You know, how do you see the impact? Uh, you know, like what are the sectors in the U.S. that are probably being affected? Uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, say the strongest. Well, printing huge amounts of money has always led to inflation. It should not be a surprise to anyone because it's always happened this way. But at the, now, as in the '70s, we have supply demand problems. You know, we are going to have electric vehicles. Well, electric vehicles use several times more copper and lead and, and lithium than regular vehicles. So that the, and nobody's been opening copper mines in a long time. So you have supply shortages developing. Agriculture is a disaster. The average age of farmers in America is 68, uh, 58. The average age in Japan is 66. I mean, we have huge supply problems developing at a time when there's been dramatic, dramatic money printing. At the Bank of Japan, the guy goes to work every day and he says, his word is, he is going to print unlimited, unlimited amounts of money. And he is. This is this has always led to problems and it should not be a surprise. Okay, not a surprise. So, uh, well, Miguel, uh, in the European situation, it's a bit different, I guess. You know, there is uh, indeed a supply issue. I mean, it's uh, in the sense it's self-imposed, like uh, the EU response to uh, Russia, for example, that's part of the sanction that will uh, try to stem their uh, say, reliance uh, on the Russian energy. Um, so they are reducing consumption from Russia, uh, the energy. So then you do see, uh, you know, shortage of supply, for example, like a credit oil, uh, uh, edible oil, and also this, uh, this uh, supply of uh, energies. I tell you, the uh, sanctions uh, that the European Union uh, has imposed on Russia, uh, and the one that the European Union is threatening to impose, like gas and oil, that have not been put in place yet, uh, actually uh, do damage uh, the European economy, and in a way, uh, help the Russian economy, because if you uh, threaten things without doing it, uh, it pushes uh, prices up because the market, uh, you know, unravel the expectation. And of course, uh, you know, energy prices uh, have gone up also because of the war in itself. But the sanctions do help uh, this uh, upward uh, movement. So it is in a way a self-inflicted increase in prices. Uh, because I also think uh, that from a strategic point of view, if you do impose uh, sanctions uh, on your uh, supplier, uh, either uh, you do it uh, uh, without telling them, uh, or if you tell them, you do it. You don't impose the sanctions uh, forward, like starting in January 2023, because between now and then, we will continue to have to buy uh, almost equal uh, amount of gas, uh, at higher prices, so because uh, uh, you are right, we are trying to find alternative uh, uh, suppliers, uh, but uh, it is impossible to replace the Russian gas uh, for the next uh, 18, 24 months. So uh, whilst we wish we could do it, the reality uh, is uh, very different. And so this creates a self-inflicted, like you said, pain on our uh, cost of energy. Now, our manufacturing uh, uh, sector in uh, Europe, in Italy and in Germany is competitive in the international market, not just because of the innovation, but also because uh, of uh, uh, energy prices. Now, if we double those, we risk to put out of business many small, medium enterprises that are the core of the export uh, uh, backbone of the Italian uh, economy. And so this has a ripple effect high energy prices, manufacturing uncompetitive, 
small medium enterprises the one that would suffer most because they don't have the scale to absorb and that would put us in a long-term recession and a, into a structural problem because we cannot recover from that very easily it would not be a temporary shock because once you wipe out the productive sector of the economy uh, it's going to be very difficult to, to replace it with some new uh, pr pr no, producer. So I I'm more worried about the problem and the uh, hit on the supply side. Mm -hmm. Well, one day, as you said, uh, is more likely a prolonged inflation, if not a severe and a severe inflation, uh, at least in the US and European countries, because you know you have this chain reaction. Uh, if you have, have you know keep this uh, prices of energy for, for high for uh, you know long enough time and then you have the high prices of gas and diesel and you have the trucks you know the cost will uh, increase and that will uh, finally uh, lead to the goods they carry from one place to another that will also you see uh, prices going up so that uh, ultimately uh, will have a dent on the consumption probably well, uh, if we look at a longer period of history, uh, the commodity prices tend to go very high, but then they collapse. If I look at the future economy globally, it just looks like uh, the insufficient demand would be the major problem rather than a shortage of the supply. People can always find alternative supply one way or another. We don't have Russia, but we have Qatar. And then there's Venezuela. Maybe uh, the worst comes to us. There's still Iran or other countries that can step up. Um, but for the demand side, we have already seen a slowdown in the European market. The US economy is still somewhat overheated, but I doubt this kind of good performance can last for very long because the Federal Reserve is hiking rates. And for China, the challenge is bigger than ever. We have to contain COVID first before we can revive the economy. And the emerging markets might face a debt crisis in the coming future. Just look at what's going on in Sri Lanka and what's going on in Argentina, uh, then Argentina. And then uh, in the next three to five years, probably the demand cannot restore to the pre-pandemic level. And by then we might see a bigger crash of the commodity prices. And then the inflation will no longer be our biggest concern. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, do you agree? Uh, at least right now you see the consumption or spending power in the U.S. market and the job prospects, uh, you know, remain strong. I mean, that's a that's a good thing. Uh, you know, you can worry less probably about the inflation, despite the price hikes. You do see uh, continuous uh, uh, strong uh, consumption. That's uh, something to celebrate. We all like uh, strong economies. There's no question about that. But you can have supply problems can lead to serious problems. And as Mr. Garachi said before, some of this is self-imposed. He talked about Europe, but in the US, the Washington has done their best to cut back pipelines. They've cut, done their best to cut back drilling for oil and gas, cut back on coal. Europe has cut back on coal a lot. So they're now they're surprised that prices are going up. Energy prices are going up. I mean, we have to understand supply and demand. It has not changed. It never has. And unfortunately, politicians worldwide usually don't understand how the economy works. And the, a lot of this is self-imposed. Now, Ms. Huang says that commodities go up, and they do, and they go up a lot, and then they collapse. That's true. But it takes a while. This doesn't happen in a week or a month or a, or a quarter. It takes a while, and it seems to me, since supply and demand are so out of whack, we're going to have commodities going higher for a while. When the war stops, it will go down for a while, but no, I, I don't see supply and demand and commodities coming into balance for a while. Uh, well, one time you mentioned about developing world, obviously, uh, they are more vulnerable uh, in terms of the ability to deal with the inflation. Um, but uh, they are suffering more in a sense because uh, there is uh, an imported inflation uh, because of, for example, uh, the, the, the Im imported goods from other parts of the world. And also there is um, a rising cost of borrowing because of the uh, rates hikes in Washington or um, possibly in other parts of the developed world. So that will increase the cost for them to borrow. So basically a lot more pain than the developed world. Right. And that's why we say the pandemic is the poor country's pandemic. The rich world, of course, are getting hit, but not nearly as severe. And for the poor countries, I do think the food inflation is probably at the core of a lot of the social problems. 
Uh, usually the social unrest is associated with food inflation and also with energy inflation, of course, one way or another. And right now, if we look at the world's developing countries, they are also having a lot of regional disparities. For most of the Asian economies, they are more or less self-sufficient in food supply, uh, including uh, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and China. In terms of the staple grains, they are more than 90% of self-sufficient. But if we look at uh, the Middle Eastern countries or African countries, they tend to rely heavily on important food and important energy. And that means they would be a lot more vulnerable than before. A lot of them were relying on a foreign investment to develop their economy, sort of uh, they're hoping to go from being an agricultural economy to industrial economy and to some more advanced form. But right now, the global investors are also worried that there might be higher risks in those markets. So money are actually flowing back to Europe and the US instead of those countries, other countries that need it the most. So there clearly needs some kind of policy coordination, which is hard to find at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Jim, uh, the response uh, or the efforts to tame the inflation seems to be you know, uh, probably the routine way to increase uh, this uh, interest rates. Um, so there are, uh, has been talk of like uh, three more times probably of a risk increase uh, by the Federal Reserve in the months to come. Uh, so is that enough to say, bring down inflation? No, of course it's not, especially when you don't have the Europeans and the Japanese and even the Chinese joining in to the extent that's necessary. If you go back to previous bouts of serious inflation, interest rates had to go very, very high. I, I, you probably don't remember the 70s, but I do. In this United States, interest rates went to over 20% before they could break inflation. And once the inflation starts, for instance, now, this is June. If you haven't planted your wheat by now, you're probably not going to plant your wheat this year because of the war or for whatever reason. And that means that the supplies will continue to run down. The inventories will run down. Maybe next year they can plant more wheat. But in the meantime, the inventories are down. Fertilizer supplies are down. That's why these things, once they get a life of their own, they often go on for a while, even if the war ends. Uh, well, Miguel, obviously, there's uh, maybe if you look at this downside uh, of this in, in, in problems, the inflations of their the economy, and you do worry about uh, people are questioning you know, whether if you accelerate the rates hikes, and then there's a risk of uh, somehow tipping the economy into a recession. Uh, for example, I mean, U.S. economy is the largest one in the world, and then European economies, people also have a similar similar concern about that. Uh, I, I agree, you know, infl uh, rates cannot be the solution. Uh, if they were to be the solution, meaning uh, bringing to those high levels, so double digits, like you mentioned, which would be necessary, it will have a negative effect uh, on the economy. You know, the problem is here that we have uh, for the last uh, two, 14 years, since 2008, to make it simple, uh, pushed our economies into small GDP growth and have largely avoided large recession in the Western countries with these monetary policies uh, for which we are now paying the price. So we have survived for 15 years without taking a major hit, except of course the 2008 and the COVID, but now we are concentrating the payback into a few months. And really, there is very little we can do. It is almost uh, uh, preferable to take a minus five, minus 10% hit now uh, for the next uh, 12 months, get rid of the problem, rearrange and reset, uh, renormalize uh, the money supply to GDP, and then think of how to recover going forward. Because if we start chasing the problem, we would have stagnation for another number of years, maybe another decade. So sometimes, this is like in war, we say the war does help the GDP. Let's think that this could be a monetary war. We have to take the price, take a hit, and then uh, move on from then. Otherwise, we will just chase the problem. And that's what I fear uh, most. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one thing, you know, ultimately, it's really about the demand and the supply. If there is ample, adequate supply, 
of goods of services, and uh, then I mean, inflation will come down, right? So it seems to me like, uh, okay, the focus probably will be on the issue of supply. Uh, in the long term, yes. And if we look at what happened in the past 20 years, uh, from the time of 2001, when China joined the WTO, that's when the rich world uh, started to see very low inflation or almost no inflation for the following two decades. And the main reason for that is because China's superb production capacity. It has pushed up the supply of goods in the whole world by so much, so it's actually hard to find inflation. Of course, there are other reasons, but I think China joining this global trade is a big change. But now the situation is different. We have seen the kind of regionalization in the global supply chain, which means the cost of production will go up. And the world is divided into three big trading blocks, one centered around the US, one in Europe, and one in Asia centered around China. So that means the goods prices will probably go up in the future without increasing the production by a whole lot. And then the energy shortage will stay for a while. But then again, uh, like Jim pointed out, the supply is a constraint, but I still think the insufficient demand will eventually bring down the energy uh, demand, which will uh, eventually bring down the inflation. And for China, um, the problem is uh, more related with domestic economy and domestic macro policies. And right now, I just don't think uh, there is a good solution to really tackle this growth problem, uh, especially about China before the COVID situation settles. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Jim, obviously uh, for the US, I mean, the inflation, uh, if, if it you know stay for long enough, that will have uh, an impact not only on the daily lives, but also a political impact, for example, uh, on, on the, the Democrats, on the Biden government. Uh, that's why Biden says that's uh, his top priority. Uh, you know, understandable, given that the midterm election are coming, so that there will be probably uh, somehow the administration will pay a price for failing to tame the inflation in a timely manner? Of course, it's going to hurt them. But I assure you, you can write it down, that the Democrats are going to suffer badly in November. But more important is the fact that once inflation gets started, historically, it is difficult to stop it. That's why in the U.S. last time interest rates had to go to over 20 percent and it led to a recession. Now, Ms. Wong has talked about recessions before, and Mr. Garaji, we have had recessions since the beginning of time. We will have more recessions. Nobody likes them, but we've always had them and we will have more. And that is what it's going to take this time to break the back of inflation. And so far, nobody, everybody, government, tries to avoid inflation and tries to avoid recession, but we're going to have recession. So, it, so far since 2009, it's been the longest period in American history without a recession. It's coming, it's coming, you can write it down. We're going to have a recession in the US, it's going to be painful since the debt is so very, very, very high in the US and the interest rates are going to go much higher. Mr. Xi, don't worry, or do worry, I guess you should work. We will have a, a recession in the US and it will be very painful because the debt is so, so high now. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Miguel, obviously it's not only about the US. I mean, if there's a problem in the US that it will have a ripple in, uh, effects, uh, uh, you know, on uh, European countries, on Asian countries and countries, other parts of the world. So. Either anyway, it seems like there's a perfect storm. We are facing this multiple crises, energy uh, high price hikes, you know, food crisis, war ongoing, COVID-19, climate change. We don't need international coordination, but that's something like we are lacking. Uh, it's true, we need it. And I'm not surprised that we are lacking because uh, uh, with the central banks uh, raising, the, as they have done in the past, uh, to who prints uh, most money, the Bank of Japan, uh, Cent European Central Bank and uh, Fed, the coordination, uh, you know, we have tried to do coordinate, but at the end of the day, there is always a perception uh, in some politician's mind that uh, uh, my win is your loss. So there is a competitive, not devaluation, because we are not looking here at pushing exports, uh, 
but uh, there is a competition on taming uh, the GDP impact, and that's why we have all printed uh, money. Coordination would be necessary, uh, but it's not sufficient because, uh, to be honest, uh, there is very little we can coordinate. I think, uh, I don't know, <laughs> today, uh, the positive news is that we are expecting an inevitable inflation. And there is very little that we can, uh, sorry, uh, the, um, uh, depression, sorry, uh, recession, recession. Your yeah. recession, yes. So if the recession is inevitable, the coordination is needed on how to manage it, not to avoid it, but how to manage it, to make it less painful, think of mechanism to compensate some of the weakest segment of the economy, maybe the low income people, do some poverty alleviation, job losses, how we we bring these people back into the market. Uh, we need to uh, assume that uh, we cannot do much to avoid it, and we need the coordination to plan for what's going to happen next. Otherwise, we also miss uh, the train of the, let's say, the reconstruction of post-recession uh, world. That's when we need the coordination because we are too late to to avoid it. So one day you see this like a rising trend of anti-globalization. Uh, or regionalization, I mean, better term probably, uh, for demand, for regionalization of a global economy, do you see, uh, yeah, regional um, trade agreements like uh, uh, RCEP, like uh, CPTPP, and the latest one, like uh, the US proposed uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, but it's basically targeting China or excluding China, instead of bring every country along and push for more free trade and globalization, like uh, every country is fighting for themselves. Oh, well, it's hard to find a common ground for all countries, but there are things that every country can work together, like climate change, right? Uh, one thing uh, that we need to understand is uh, that every country needs to understand others, uh, where others are standing. Uh, like recently in Davos, uh, the Secretary General of NATO was talking about freedom was uh, more important, is more important than free trade. A lot of people disagree with that statement, but we need to understand where that is coming from. So for China, climate change is clearly something it can contribute a lot to the global development for the next 20 years. Uh, so is America, so is Europe. And Europe is in a position of making a lot of the rules up front. And China, in a way, is a follower uh, for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the practices, and it's also innovating in its own way. So, for America, it clearly can step up its effort in making more industrial policies going that direction. So, there is a silver lining in the background of all those pessimism. So, I haven't lost all the hopes yet. Well, on that note, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>